bye 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 sí 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 sí
Bueno, egunon guztioi, ongi etorriak, e, udako ikastaro honetara, Gipuzkoako Foru Aldundiak eta Euskarriko Unibertsitateak lankidetzak antolatzen duten e, udako ikastaro honetara, gobernantzari buruzko ikastaro, ikastaro honetara, diputado nausia, batzar nausietako presidenta, Eusko Legibiltzarreko presidenta, lehiakortasunako zailburua, diputatuak, eta gainerako guztiak, ezagun asko, lagunak, asko eta asko, e, bueno, ongi etorriak. E, ez nahiz ni e, luzatuko sarreretan, ze gaur egun oparoa daukagu, jende asko hitz egiteko eta, eta gai interesgarriak. E, legaldi berri honetan, diputadu nausiaren gidaritzapean, eta baita ere gobernantza eta gizartearekiko harremanen e, diputaduarekin e, lankidetzan, e, kezka bat jarri zen asiera asieratik e, mai gainean. Da, kezka hori izan, ba, hain zuzen ere, e, erritarrak urruti daudela politikatik, desafekzio politiko ahondia dagoela, mundua asko aldatu dela, e, erakunde publikoen duten eragina e, asko murriztu dela, e, ezagutza falta ahondia dagoela, politikaren balioak ba, bera egin duela, neurria ahondi batean, eta... Hori ez da, Euskal Herriari eta Gipuzkoari eragiten dion gauza bakarrik, baita ere, eragiten die, ba, nik esango nuke, mendebaldeko demokrazia guztiei, baina kezka hori ardatz nagusitzat hartuta, ba, etorkizuna eraikiz programa jarri zen martxan. E, zer da etorkizuna eraikiz? Etorkizuna eraikiz, e, Gipuzkoako Foru Aldundiaren programa estrategiko bat da, e, gabineteak, e, diputadu nagusiaren gabineteak eta gobernantzako E, diputaduaren departamentuak elkarlanean daramaten e, egitasmoa, programa, eta helburu nagusi bat du. Eta da, inzuzen ere, etorkizunari buruz pentsatzea. Ikusten duguna da, jendeak eskatuta dagoela etorkizunarekin, eta etorkizuna lantzea, pentsatzea, e, bi, bi zentzutan. Alde batetik, zer nolako etorkizuna nahi degun, e, paradigma aldaketa baten aurrean gaude, e, gure eguneroko bizitzan ikusten dugu e, aldaketa hori, e, gure alabek e, mugikorra hartzen dutenean, telebistako albisteak ikusten ditugunean, gure enpresetan dauden aldaketak, eta inbat eta inbat gai berri jarri zaizkigu mai gainean, gure eguneroko, gure eguneroko bizitzan, aldaketa klimatikoa, konziliazioa, e, enpresalen e, aipatu dudan bezala, unibertsitateak mundura irikitzen ari dira, Alegia, agenda politiko berri bat dago hor kalean, gure eguneroko bizitzan, eta Gipuzkoako Foru Aldundiak agenda politiko horri heldu egin nahiko, heldu egin nahiko lioke. Lehenik, datozen, helburu eta herri politik ez gain, e, torkizuna orain aldira ekarri nahi dugu. Eta bigarren elementu nagusia, nik aipatu nahiko nukeena, sarrera hontan da, agenda politiko hori ekarri nahi dugu orain aldira, baina aldi berean, e, ez dugu edozein modutan ekarri nahi. Baizik eta iruditzen zaigu, etorkizunean e, lana egiteko beste eredu batzuk landu behar ditugula. Bai herritarrekin eta baita ere e, gizarte antolatuarekin edo gizarte, gizarte eragileekin. Eta horri heldu diogu programa etorkizunearekin, ze programarekin duela urte bete hasi ginen, eta gaurko e, ikas, gaur asten den ikastar honen, udako ikastar honen helburua ez da bakarrik e, bestei entzutea, baizik eta parte hartzea, elkarrezketa beratz bat izatea, Ez gatoz, ikastar honetara autokomplazentziarekin edo marketinerako programa bat e, erakusteko, baizik eta espiritu autokritikoarekin ikasteko, eta bueno, ea denon artean lortzen dugun hori, etorkizun hori, orain aldian lantzen astea e, de, denon artean. E, Juan Gonaiz gero aurkezten e, ponente bakoitza, daokione, daokione momentuan, baino e, sarrera honetarako, Ba, gustatuko litzai dake e, Gipuzkoako diputadu nagusia e, aurkeztea eta aurrez e, Euskarriko Unibertsiadeko errektore ordea den e, Agustin Erkiziari emango dio titza eta gero ekitaldiari e, asera emango dio edo sarrera egingo dio Gipuzkoako diputadu nagusiak Marke Lorano. Eskarrik asko, denei etortzea datik eta ea egun pare hau erabat oparoak zaizkigun. Mila eskar.
Egun on guztioi eta ongi etorriei uda ikastaro honetara. Gobernantza elkarlanekoa eta partaidetza demokratiko bat datoz, Euskal Herriko Unibertsietaren uda ikastaroan onarrizko elburuakin. Hain zuzen ere, gaurko gertakari politiko eta soziala iburuzko hausnarketa eta estabidagune berezi bat eskaintzea du ikastaronek berezede. Baina ezingo nuke gaur orkestu diguten ude ikastaronen zuzendariak baina hobeto, adirazi zein den ikastaronen ardatz nagusia. Ez da ere, etorkizuna eraikiz proiektuaren mamia. Ze garrantzi duen gipuzkoako etorkizunareko, baina unibestiaren aldetik ekimen honen balioa nabarmen duna ikonoke. Erritarrek etorkizunagatik duten kezka da proiektu honen ardaz nagusia ardura hori berea egindu gipuzkoako foro aldundiak eta unibestiadeak baita ere. Lurraldearen etorkizuna berea baliz bezala hartzen baitu. Euskal Herriko Unibertsitatea gizarte erikeko duen kompromisua aintzat hartuz, gipuzkoako sektore eta estamentu guztietan diarduen profesional multzo handi baten prestakuntzaz arduratzen da. Era berean, goimailiako eskuntzaren sati handi batez arduratzen da baita ere, eta ikerketa ere bere ardatz nagusietariko bada. Azken batean, unibertsitateak bere proiektutzat du gaur bildu gaituena. Unibertsitatea etorkizuna da. Bere irakaskuntza eta ikerketa lanek etorkizuna dute elburu. Etorkizuna eraiki behar baituku unibertsitaren parte hartzea ezinbestekoa bihurtuz. Espero dut, gaur irekitzen dugun uda ikastaroa, gai honen inguruan gogoeta egiteko aukera paregabia izatea, lortuko diren emaitzak, bali handikoak izango direlako, eta lagundu egingo digutelako gure etorkizuna eraikitzen. Ni aldetik besterik ez, eta mila esker zuen arreta gaitik. Agintariok, Unibertsitateko Ordizkarioak, Izlari Gonbidatuok, Ikasta honotara etorri zarretan guztioi, egunon, eta ongi etorri. Egia esan, beti da plazerra eta plazerra hondia Unibertsitatera etortzea, eta zero berik auztuko oporra ditxoaren ondoren, eta kurso berriaren hasieran, elkarrekin hausnartzera, eztabaidatzera eta ikastera etortzea baino. Eta are gehiago, orain jasten dugun bestalako ikastaro interesgarri batera etortzea. Kudeak eta publikoko eguneroko martxan, geldi aldia egin eta ezagutzaren arnasa hartzera. Horregatik eta beste ezer baino lehenago, eskerrak eman nahi dizkio, Deskalariko Unibertsitateari, ikastaro hau antolatzeko aukera eman digulako. Gobernantza irekia eta lankidetazkoa. Etorkizuna eraikiz kasua. Gobernanza abierta y colaborativa. El caso es Torquizón Arikis. Hori izango da, e, udako ikastaronen izena. Ia zantolatu genuen, elkarlanerako gobernantza irekiari buruzko kurso emankorra, eta urte guztian zehar, legealdi asiratik dugun bide horretan sakontzen jarraitu dugu. Gobernantzaren gainan alegia. Testu inguru horretan, joan den ikasturtean, etorkizuna eraikiz, egitasmo zabal eta ambiziosua martxan jarri dugu. Gaur hasten dugun ikastaro honetan, gobernantza irekiari eta elkarlanekoari begira jarriko gara nazioarteko adituen ezagutza jasoz eta hainbat kasu ezberdin ezagutuz. Eta guztion artean, gure egitasmoa, alegia etorkizuna eraikiz, hobetzea eta indartzea ere bada asmoa. Hortaz, gobernantza, elkarlana eta etorkizuna izango ditugu izpide eta ez da bai da bai. Utziko dituzue, ikastaro honen irekia honetan, hainbat ideia eta kezka zuekin partekatzen eta modu horretan plaza honetara nire ekarpentsua ere egiten. Eta hasteko, konbentzimentu bat azpimaratu nahi dut. Politika beharrezkoa dugu. Agian, gehiagi esatea izango da gure egungo mundu honetan politika inoiz baino beharrezkoago dugula esatea. Baina ziur nago, politika gaur egun ere inoiz izan duen balio handiena eta premiazkoena baduela. Jakin badakigu, azken urteotan, 
politikaren desprestigio handia gertatu dela. Eta horretarako arrazoi asko egon dira. Eta nola ukatu hori. Baina gure buruari, gure herriari eta gure etorkizunari mesede gutxi egingo diogu, politika mota baten desprestigioa politika behar ez izatearekin nahastuko bagendu. Azken urteotan, Europan, Meldebaldean eta oroar munduan gertatzen ari diren mugimendu korronte eta joera politikoei begiratzen badiegu, erraz antzeman ditzakegu politika erabat ezabatu nahi duten korronte neoliberal populistak. Edo ustez, politika berrien dartuz, demokrazia ahuldu asmo duten ideia totalitario eta antisistemak. Zoritxarrez, hoiek guztiek erakusten dute gizarte hobe, aske eta oparagoak bermatzeko ez direla gai. Eta kasu askotan, giza duintasunaren eta balio demokratikoen aurkakoak direla. Horregatik, politikaren beharra azpimarratuz nire lehen aldarrikapena. Egungo munduko behar zanei erantzuteko, politika behar dugu. Politika letra larriz behar dugu. Baina ze politika? Munduan zehar, sakon eta asko ari da aldatzen. Mundu konplexu eta interdependentean bizi gara. Eta duela ez hain beste urte, oso ziur genituen eskema, sistema eta sinesmen askok ez digute jada balio. Gure behar izan kolektibu asko eta munduko gai eta eztabaidai zentral asko ere aldatzen ari dira. Eta hori ere erantzuteko politika behar dugu. Baina batez ere politikan berrikuntza behar dugu. Ezin diegu arazo, kezka, gai, behar izan eta baldintza berriei sistema, modu eta eskema zaharrekin erantzun. Ari gara saiatzen berritzen, ari gara apustu berritzaileak egiten, baina ez da nahikoa. Atzetik goaz gauza askotan. Eta hau bezalako foroek balio behar digute bultzaba berriak emateko benetako berrikuntza politiko horri. Ezin gara politikaren azaleko berrikuntzan edo innovazio estetikoan gelditu. Sakonean aldatu behar dugu gure politika gintza, gure erakunde publikoen lan egiteko modua, gure erlazio sistema, gure elkarlan sistema. Baina beti ere, sistema demokratikoan sakonduz eta indartuz. Arduraun politiko negitekoa hori ere bada, eta zehorrenik egin dezakegun ekarpena hondiena da, politikaren berrikuntza bultzatzea eta sakontzea. Gure herri eta ozoetan, gure gizartean begiratuz, erronka berriak antzematen ditugu. Gizartearen zahartzea, ekonomiaren laiakortasuna, ekologia, ezagutzaren sarea indartzea. Hoiek badira gure kezka eta beharrak. Baina hoiekin batera, munduko beste gai batzuek ere eragiten digute, errealitate berri batzuek ere eragina digute. Eta begista zabatzen badugu, aregeiago antzematen ditugu mundu aldakor eta konplexuan erronka berriak. Europako batasuneko antolakuntza, adibidez oso gaur eguneko Kataluniako prozesu politikoa, brexitaren gaia, errefuxiatuen krisia, energiaren gaia, xenofobia berriak, klima aldaketa, dihadismoa, uraren gatazka, eligion arteko harremana, eta abar, eta abar. Hoi eirantzuteko ezin bestean behar dugu politika. Oso oker eta ardura gabe jokatuko genuke, hoi eirantzuna politikarik gabe eman behar izaiela pentsatzen eta pentsatuko bagendu. Agenda eta eztabaida publiko berriak daude munduan eta gurean, eta modu berrietara politika berrituz erantzun behar diegu hoi ei. Pero como se hace? profundizando en nuevos modos de gobernanza, entre otros. Y para ello, nuestra propuesta, nuestro principal proyecto, es Etorkizuna Eraikiz. Es el nuevo sistema de gobernanza para que la Diputación Foral de Guipúzcoa se relacione y, sobre todo, trabaje en colaboración con la sociedad guipuzcoana, las asociaciones, las empresas, la red de conocimiento y la ciudadanía del territorio. Una colaboración que pretende responder a los retos de futuro de Guipúzcoa. Precisamente se trata de una amplia plataforma creada para poder responder conjuntamente a los nuevos retos públicos y políticos a los que se enfrenta el mundo, pero también el territorio de Guipúzcoa. 
una herramienta necesaria para lograr el bienestar de nuestro futuro. Es bien conocido que las dos prioridades de la Diputación Foral de Guipúzcoa son construir el futuro y promover la economía. Estamos convencidos de que el bienestar de nuestro territorio y de la sociedad guipuzcoana solo se puede lograr a través del desarrollo y la competitividad económica. Que el desarrollo de la economía es el medio para lograr nuestro principal objetivo, que es que todos los guipuzcoanos y todas las guipuzcoanas podamos gozar de una vida lo más plena y satisfactoria posible. No a cualquier precio ni de cualquier manera, sino siendo socialmente responsables y solidarios, siendo competitivos también socialmente. Y es por eso por lo que nos aferramos a un sueño alcanzable, hacer de Guipúzcoa uno de los territorios con menos desigualdad del mundo. En efecto, estamos plenamente convencidos de que para el desarrollo y progreso de una sociedad y para promover su bienestar, es totalmente necesario enfocar la acción pública al desarrollo económico y social. Y estamos también plenamente convencidos de que nuestro futuro solo lo podemos y debemos construir nosotros mismos. De que este mundo tan acelerado, cambiante e incierto, y en este mundo hoy es más necesario que nunca que asumamos nosotros mismos la responsabilidad de encauzar nuestro futuro. Porque, en efecto, cuando en nuestro entorno, en Euskadi, en Europa, en el mundo, se están produciendo profundas y rápidas transformaciones, es preciso que los guipuzcoanos y guipuzcoanas, los vascos en general, actuemos con lucidez y presteza para que el bienestar actual no nos nuble la mirada hacia los retos y dificultades que se nos presentan cara al futuro. Al comienzo de esta legislatura pusimos en marcha el Plan Especial para la Reactivación Económica, que cuenta con un presupuesto de 50 millones de euros al año. Afortunadamente, y gracias en parte y de un modo muy importante también al contexto, este plan ya está dando sus frutos. El Plan de Reactivación Económica ha ayudado durante este periodo a 3.000 empresas y centros para que lleven a cabo sus proyectos, sus inversiones y puedan avanzar en competitividad e innovación. También hemos apoyado la creación de más de 400 empresas nuevas. Nuestra actual competitividad económica no es suficiente para garantizar nuestro bienestar futuro, pero sí constituye la única base sobre la que podamos cimentar y asegurar el bienestar futuro de Guipúzcoa. Por ello, estamos ayudando a responder a los retos diarios a los que se enfrentan las empresas e industria de nuestro territorio. Pero, al mismo tiempo, estamos construyendo las bases que garanticen nuestra competitividad y nuestra economía de cara al futuro. Porque es imprescindible que también nuestra institución y la propia política sean competitivas. Para poder eh, y para todo ello, hemos puesto en marcha, como he dicho antes, Héctor Kistuna Ereikiz. Empresa munduan, krisi edo zailtasun egoera batean sartzen denean, eta empresa bat sartzen denean egoera horretan, Bere biziraupena eta etorkizuna bermatu nahi badu, zer egiten du? Merkatu, berri bile, merkatu berrien bila hasi, produktu eta zerbitzuak diversifikatu, erakundearen antolakuntza transformatu, aliantza berriak bilatu, teknologia berrietan invertitu, berrikuntzan sakondu. Enpresak aurrera egingo badu, eta ondorioz, enpresak aberastasuna eta ongizatea sortuko badu, ezin bestean baldintza berrietara egokitu beharra dauka bere burua. Amaika, adibide eta esperientzia eredu garri ditugu horrenak gipuzkoan, eta badugu denok zerik hasi. Politikaren eta erakunde publikoen ere muan ere, baldintza berri eta transformazio sakonetan dago egun. Gizartearen aldaketa estruktural handiekin, gure herri erakundeak ere egokitu beharra daude, pertsonen egungo beharrei erantzuteko ezezik, etorkizuneko funtzioak eta e, ere bete alizateko. Erronka haundia da eta erantzunak oso zailak. Besteak beste, enpresek egiten dutenetik ikasiz eta herri erakundeak egungo eta geroko baldintzetara egokitu nahian, biharrari begiratuz eta ekimen zabal bat jarri dugu martxan, etorkizunarikiz, eta ez da oiko programa edo plan bat, baizik eta etorkizuneko erronkei aurre hartu eta erantzuna eman eta horretarako foru galdun diabera transformatzeko nahi duen ekimen bada. No nos, engañe, eh, no nos engañemos. Los grandes retos a futuro que los guipuzcoanos y guipuzcoanas no solo afrontan no solo son la gestión de los residuos o la implantación de peajes en las carreteras. Los principales retos de la sociedad guipuzcoana hoy 
son responder con antelación y acierto a las grandes variables que condicionan nuestro bienestar. Llevar a buen puerto las transformaciones que posibiliten la competitividad de nuestras empresas. Responder de manera integral al reto del envejecimiento de nuestra sociedad. Profundizar en la igualdad de hombres y mujeres. Promover políticas de conciliación para el desarrollo pleno de las personas. Aumentar la tasa de natalidad. Crear empleo de calidad. Promover nuestra lengua. Desarrollar nuestra cultura e identidad. Crear y atraer talento. Promover políticas sociales que reduzcan las diferencias sociales y las situaciones de exclusión. Estos son, en definitiva, nuestros grandes retos de futuro. Y a ellos estamos haciendo frente en redes colaborativas a través de la experimentación activa. Y estamos desarrollando proyectos piloto, codo con codo, con las instituciones públicas, las redes de conocimiento, las empresas, la sociedad civil y la ciudadanía para construir este futuro. Porque solo podremos avanzar si trabajamos en colaboración, en Auzolán, como nos enseña nuestro ADN guipuzcoano y nuestra tradición, encauzando y dando soluciones democráticas a visiones y opiniones tan diversas como legítimas y profundizando en una nueva cultura política necesaria para hacer lo posible. Desde el punto de vista económico, debemos crear nuevos ámbitos y espacios de colaboración también en nuestro territorio. Los diversos agentes, las empresas y las instituciones necesitamos espacios que nos permitan promover y materializar los proyectos innovadores. Y debemos hacerlo utilizando con valentía e inteligencia las capacidades, conocimientos y oportunidades que nos brinda nuestro tejido económico. Apoyándonos en esta reflexión, estamos trabajando en el diseño de cinco centros de referencia para impulsar nuevos espacios de colaboración, para fortalecer la industria que ya poseemos en sectores de gran potencial y de futuro, y para posibilitar su creación en sectores emergentes. Por ejemplo, en relación a la industria 4.0, estamos trabajando en un centro de ciberseguridad para favorecer así la competitividad de nuestras pequeñas y medianas empresas industriales. En el tema del almacenamiento de energía y movilidad sostenible, también contamos con unas fuertes bases en Guipúzcoa que nos ayudarán a desarrollar una industria importante. Y también impulsaremos un centro de referencia en este sector para promover la innovación y la investigación. O en el ámbito de las biociencias y la salud, en Pasaya construiremos un centro avanzado para la atención de las personas mayores y en situación de dependencia. Se trata de un centro cuya mirada se dirige a la experimentación y a las nuevas empresas. También en lo referido a la gastronomía, Donostia es uno de los lugares más potentes de Europa. Estamos trabajando en la creación de un centro para el desarrollo de tecnología digital dirigida a este ámbito. O en el, centro, en el sector audiovisual, nuestro territorio necesita contar con un centro que promueva especialmente la creación de contenidos en euskera, que responda a una sociedad cada vez más habituada a la multipantalla. multipantalla. Etorkizuna baikortasunez eta ilusioz ikusten dut. Gipuzkoaren bilakara ekonomikoa eta soziala baikortasunez ikusten ditut. Baina horretarako, ezin besteko dugu gure politika egintzan, gobernantza sistemetan ere berritzea eta elkarrekin eraikitzea. Gipuzkoak etorkizun oparua du, benetan nik sinisten dut honetan. Eta foro hau horren adibide handia da. Gizarteko, ekonomiako, universitateko eta herri erakundetako ordezkariak eta herritarrak elkarrekin gure geroa eraikitzeko ikasten eta eztabaidatzen. Kanpoko puntakoen gandik esperientzia horrena jasoz eta gureak kanpora proiektatuz. Benetan arro egon gaitezke hemen dagoen indar, borondate eta ezagutzarekin. Beraz, milesker denoi eta bereziki ponente gisa ikastora hauetan parte hartuko duzuen John Donahiu, Manuel Arenilla, Laura Gallego, Ariel Ramírez Orrego, Lorena Pulido, David Van Slyk, Julien Defet, Matt Ryan eta Imanol Lazari. Etorkizuna gure esku dago. Etorkizuneko lurraldearen ongizatea gure esku dago. Eta elkarrekin eraiki ditzagun. Eskarrik asko. Eskarrik asko. Markel, diputado Nagusia, Eskerrik Asko Agustin Erkizia, Euskarriko Universitateko errektore ordea. Bueno, bagaurko ekitaldi honi hasiera eman da zarrerako itzaldiari ekingo diogu, hemen dugu dagoeneko 
gurekin Jon Donagiu. E, Jon Donagiu, e, politika publikoko irakasle titularra da, Rain von Bernonen, Amerikako Estatu Batu eta Harvard Kennedy Schoolen, Clintonen lehen administrazioan e, jardun zuen baita ere, lehenik idazkari orde mordura, okarazu alin maude, eta gero enplegu idazkariko aholkulari. Eta, bueno, eta bere kurrikuluna itxe egiten hasiko baina, ba, udako ikastaro guztia beharko genuke, eta besterik gabe, berari eskatu diogu, aditua den e, gai hontan, bain zuzen ere, e, gobernantza, lankidetza gobernantzari buruz itxe egiteko, eta lankidetza publiko pribatuari buruz. Nola garatu daiteken gizarte eragiletzatik eta ambito pribatutik, hain zuzen ere, e, espiritu, espiritu publiko hori. Besterik gabe, eskarrik asko gurekin izateagatik. Welcome to San Sebastian, to Basque Country. E, thank you very much. So before I came here, I had heard about the famous Basque hospitality, which I have already experienced. Uh, yesterday evening, uh, Cabinet Chief Barandiaran uh, and some other leaders hosted a small informal gathering at a wonderful place over by the comb of the wind. And we watched the sun go down, for all of, all of the international speakers, we watched the sun go down, we had marvelous pinchos and cider and wine, and uh, Cabinet Chief Brandiaran gave uh, some very gracious remarks, welcoming the international visitors, saying he hoped that Gapuzkoa could learn from us, but also that we could learn from Gapuzkoa. And I would like to tell you I have already learned three important lessons from Gapuzkoa. I will tell you how I learned these lessons. I was after the gathering, I was walking back to the hotel along the beautiful path by the sea. And there were lots of happy people on the path after the boat races. And about halfway between the comb of the wind and my hotel, two large groups of friends encountered each other on the path. I think they must have been from the same village here for the boat race. And they stopped and they chatted and they blocked the path completely. And nobody was upset about that. All the other Basque people uh, on the path with me just simply went along to the side and didn't bother the people there. And I followed them along to the side. And I was thinking about what I'd heard earlier in the evening and what I was going to tell you today. And suddenly, I found myself lying on the ground, like Paul on the road to Damascus. And here are the three things that Gaputhkoa had taught me. The first thing, there was a tree branch off to the side of the path. The second thing, I am a little bit taller than most Basque people. <laughs> and the third thing I learned is that I am perhaps not as smart as Cabinet Chief Bondarian believes I am. <laughs> but I will nonetheless uh, try to, in exchange for the lessons Gabuthkoa has taught me, I will try to offer some lessons as well. Uh, I'm going to talk a bit about some definitions, different kinds of, of governance, and invite you to understand that a good way to think about different kinds of public and private interaction is in terms of who is in control, who has discretion within the relationship. And I will try to define what I call collaborative governance and distinguish it from other forms of public-private interaction. I will talk about some of the advantages and some of the risks of this approach to governance. I will give a few very brief examples, and I will talk about the analytical and the management imperatives that are involved in doing this well. And I will offer a few very brief observations on the specific case of the Basque country. Most of what I have to say is drawn from a book called Collaborative Governance that I did with a co-author uh, a few years ago. A little bit is drawn from a book I did myself uh, about the peculiarities of public sector labor markets in the advanced world. And a tiny little bit is drawn from a wonderful book uh, that Javier Font recommended to me, The Basque History of the World. So I guess one question, why 
here now in 2017 are we talking so much about public-private collaboration? What is different about this moment in history from 20 years ago or 50 years ago? Um, one thing that has changed is as society becomes more complex, public tasks are moving towards things that either invite or sometimes absolutely require the engagement of the private sector. Uh, there also is a relative erosion in the capacity of the state. Governments in much of the rich uh, world are declining in capability relative to the private sector in financial terms, but especially in terms of highly skilled personnel, which are the most important resources for accomplishing almost any mission. There are also new institutional and technological tools new forms of measuring and monitoring, new kinds of legal institutions that permit more complicated kinds of relationships than would have been feasible in the past. We often think of the, uh, the model of public service in the mid 20th century uh, when I was born and uh, the later 20th century when I grew up. Uh, the basic model involved central state dominance. You know, the nation state was the most important actor, uh, direct governmental action. Governments did things themselves. They hired people, they built organizations to do the work. And government administration was quite elite. The smartest people in most societies were doing the work of the central government. This is changing. Public service is moving away from that 20th century model. And it's changing in two directions both um, up and down, up to levels of governance above the nation state, such as the EU, down to levels of governance below the nation state, subsidiarity, uh, such as the Basque country and the individual provinces. And this is something that's occurring through most of the world. But beyond that movement up and down, which I won't really discuss today, there's been movement out from the state itself and to private organizations which are somewhat simplistically described as for-profit or not-for-profit. Okay. So we now have, instead of all the action being in the middle, in the, in the nation state, we have tasks associated with governance, tasks that are important to the welfare of the community as a whole, that are carried out in part by a whole different array of organizations. Now, one of the important things that's driving this, and one uh, area of, uh, of my abiding interest in research, is uh, discrepancies in, comp in compensation between the public and private sector. Uh, I wrote a book in 2008, I believe, and uh, this chart actually is about 80% of the content of that book which is a little embarrassing, because if I can tell 80% in one chart, uh, one wonders why I wrote a whole book about it. But the basic notion is that in the public sector, compensation is relatively flat. The low end earns, low end in terms of skill, talent, training, whatever you want to think about, uh, earns less than the high end but not a great deal less. That is a characteristic of government, and it always has been a characteristic of government. Okay. And back in you know, the 1970s, 1980s, when I was growing up, the private sector offered higher pay at the high end and lower pay at the low end. That is nothing new, that is perennial. What is new is that in the past 30 years or so, in all of the rich countries, there has been an explosion of inequality in the private sector. And at the high end, the ceiling has blown off. At the low end, the bottom has fallen out. And so what used to be small gaps in compensation at the high end and the low end between government and the private sector have now become enormous gaps. And this has quite serious consequences for government's ability to operate. The gap at the top which is the more obvious problem, means that government doesn't get its share 
of top talent, and it's not as smart as it needs to be. Less obviously, but no less importantly, the gap at the bottom, the fact that less skilled people, and by less skilled, I basically mean anybody with less than a university degree, less skilled people do much better in government than they would in the private sector. That gap makes government less flexible than it needs to be. Because there are lots and lots of people who recognize they have a great deal to lose if they lose their government jobs or if their government jobs become like business jobs. And so they are very defensive and resist change. And I would too. But that syndrome means the government becomes less flexible. So if the mid 20th century model featured central state dominance, direct government action, and an elite public service, we're moving towards a new model where you have the erosion of the central nation state preeminence. This place right here is a dramatic example of that, where the nation state of Spain is considerably less important than it was 30 or 40 years ago, and the higher level of the EU and the lower level of the uh, provinces and the Basque country are more important. A broad shift from direct to indirect governmental action, greater roles for private agents, and all of this amid chronic talent shortages in the public sector. When I say an enlarged role for private agents, by the way, I want to be very clear. This is not compared to the way things have always been, but rather, rather compared to the 20th century model. And in some ways, the 20th century model is more the exception than the rule. If you look at uh, the broad sweep of hi the history of government, there's actually a, uh, a uh, book by uh, J.S. Finer, three volume book by Oxford University Press called The History of Government. I might be the only person other than Mrs. Finer who's read the whole thing. It's possibly one of my, my colleagues here as well, because it's a very big book. But it actually shows that through most of the history of government, public activity has been more indirect, more involving the private sector than involving the conventional state. Uh, so this change is only relative to the mid 20th century. In some ways, a return to the historical norm. If you think of uh, Roman tax administration, that was entirely contracted out, contracted out. The basic model is that the Romans would put out a bid and say, how much uh, are you willing to pay for the right to collect taxes from a particular region? And then you can collect all the taxes you're able to squeeze from the peasants. So this contractual model of Roman tax administration is uh, why tax collectors figure so badly in the Bible. They were kind of rough on the, pe the peasants. Another dramatic example is mercenaries. Um, we in the modern world tend to think of mercenaries as an aberration, you know, soldiers are citizens. Soldiers are not for hire. But in fact, for much of our history, I'm told by military historians, up until Venice in the early Middle Ages, citizen armies were unusual. And if a leader wanted to wage war, he would hire mercenaries. Now, when I speak about this normally, I would say he would hire mercenaries, and if he could afford them, he would hire the Swiss. But in reading a little bit about the Basque country, I have learned that, in fact, way before the Swiss were the world's best mercenaries, the Basques uh, were considered the world's best mercenaries. And the, the famous Basque army that fought for Hannibal against the Romans, uh, even more formidable than the Swiss. So from now on, when I speak about mercenaries, the, my example will be the Basques rather than the Swiss. Um, also, trade companies, uh, that you know, there was a time that the completely public mission of exploration and spreading influence around the world was carried out not by governmental organizations, but by private organizations, such as the famous British East India Company, or the Dutch East India Company. These were private profit-seeking, very much profit-seeking organizations, but they were in some ways arms of the British and Dutch state. And again, uh, I have used these examples in the past. I will now more often use the example 
of the uh, Royal Gipuzkoa Company of Caracas, which was similar to uh, the British and Dutch East India Company. It was set up to, uh, in part, uh, to make money, and it actually had, but it had some public features. Public features included the fact it was chartered by the Spanish king. It explicitly and effectively served foreign policy goals of the Spanish government. It served economic development goals of the Basque region. That was part of its mission. And it had and used military capabilities. So it had definitely some public features. It had some private features as well. It was founded by wealthy Basques, not by any government. Its main goal was for these wealthy Basques to get wealthier, even though it served other public goals on the way to it. It was answerable to owners and not to citizens, and that's a very important distinction. Even though the wealthy people who started the company felt themselves very much to be Basques and cared about the Basque region as a whole, the company's goal was to do well for the owners and only secondarily to achieve any other purposes. And it was free to shift missions as its original mission became less desirable and new opportunities arose. And in fact, uh, it eventually became the Gipuzkoa Company uh, for the Philippines. So, hold that aside for a moment. Um, one broad question that arises in this, uh, this issue of why do we talk about public-private collaboration now, if there are in fact increasingly public tasks that require the special capabilities of private organizations, well an obvious response to that is just change government. Just change government so that it behaves more like private organizations. If you need private capabilities, import them into government. And when I was working in uh, the Clinton administration, I was actually involved in a massive, quite serious, and to some extent successful effort to change government to make it more like business. And this has been a very fashionable theme in scholarship and also practice for so for a very long time. But here's the, and, and let me underscore, if it's, if it's easy to change government, to make government like business, there's no reason for collaboration. Government doesn't need the private sector. Government can do everything itself. Here is why I think there is a limit to that approach. Here is why I think collaboration is necessary. And that's that there are serious limits to how much you can do in making government more like business. Here's how I think about this. Uh, I think it's not that business is more accountable than government, or government is more accountable than business, it's that the two kinds of organization have different forms of accountability. And I think of these as extensive accountability versus intensive accountability. Extensive accountability is characteristic of public organizations. That is accountability on a large number of dimensions to a large number of people. At the extreme, think about the Secretary General of the United Nations, you know, who in some ways is accountable to everybody on the planet, except the North Koreans and a few others, on just about any dimension you might care to think of. At the other extreme, imagine um, you, know, you have a chef in one of the restaurants in town, and he gets tired of cooking every night, so he turns the restaurant over to a hired manager and goes to retire in the countryside. Well, think about the, 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 the hired manager. You know, her responsibility is, at the extreme, one dimension, how much money is sent, to one person, the retired chef. Okay? So that's very intensive accountability. So I would say that extensive accountability is what defines a public organization, and intensive accountability is what defines a private organization. And here is the point. You can't maximize both. You can't make an organization maximally accountable on both dimensions. At least, I have never seen it happen. 
It's possible that in the Basque country, you're much better at that. I mean, I mean that serious. It's, it's, it's quite possible that the Basque country, the Basque people have found ways to combine intensive and extensive accountability, but I have never seen it before. And so if you have a piece of work that requires intensive accountability, it's often a good idea to find a way to get private organizations to do that piece of work. Conversely, if a task properly involves extensive accountability, it's very hard to remove government from the picture. Broadly accountable, electorally accountable government. And because the different kinds of organizations have different strengths and weaknesses, collaboration between them is very often important. They cannot replace each other. So extensive accountability, an example was uh, the uh, Jose Antonio Aguirre, the short-lived president of the Basque country back in the 1920s, uh, said that as president of my country, I swear to serve my term faithfully. There can be no better statement of extensive accountability. He is declaring his accountability very broadly and to all Basques. Conversely, think back again of the uh, Royal Company, uh, Kaputko and Company of Caracas, uh, private organization, accountable more broadly than some private organizations, but ultimately responsible to its owners for their wealth. And at one point, the Royal Kaputko Company of Caracas tried to enter the slave trade, even though the slave trade was repugnant to Basque values. Okay. It looked like it was going to be profitable. So they felt they were obliged to try to enter it. I think to the relief of everybody, they failed in the slave trade. Uh, but the fact that they considered it, I think is an illustration of the intensive accountability of private organizations. So this distinctive feature of intensive accountability means that private organizations are often much better to able to control costs, much more flexible, they're much hungrier to find new ways to do things, and these are advantageous for some private tasks. Involving private players in public service can sometimes bring resources, can bring increases in productivity, can bring in information relevant to the accomplishment of some pub private public task, and often can bring in legitimacy as well. This is often sometimes a feature in the United States where we tend not to like, you know, we like to have as, as little government as possible. Uh, and so sometimes involving the private sector, even if there are no other advantages, can bring legitimacy. So actually a, one example that uh, I discovered in my research was in the United States when we set up our the first stage of our uh, public health insurance system, uh, Medicare, providing health for, for the retired and elderly, it was very controversial, great deal of political resistance to the radical notion of providing health care for elderly people. And uh, President Lyndon Johnson brought in his political advisors and said, how can I make it more likely that this will pass the Senate? And his advisors said, make sure that there is a maximum role for business. Even if it doesn't make sense, bring in business. And so um, one important function was designating and monitoring the hospitals to allow them to take Medicare patients, to, to treat old pe elderly people and charge the government. And there was an organization uh, that was already in the business of certifying hospitals for uh, private insurance. And some of Lyndon Johnson's advisors said, well, we could put this organization in charge of certifying, certifying hospitals for government insurance. And Johnson said, do they do, go, do a good job? And they said, not particularly, you know, they're okay. We would do a better job in the government, but if we say this is a private function for government, it will create more legitimacy. And so that private organization was in the legislation given responsibility for certifying hospitals. 
Interestingly, the, the organization didn't even know that it was being, being assigned in the legislation that task, it's called the Joint Commission on Healthcare Organizations. So it was a, a happy surprise for them that they were then in charge of the, the flow of money for government insurance. Um, the United States is a little bit unusual in the high legitimacy it accords the private sector relative to government, but it's not the only place where bringing in private organizations can improve the legitimacy of public tasks. And yet there are also risks involved in involving the private sector. Uh, one is that government tends to lose control over the cost of public services or the performance of public services. Uh, another is that the public agenda can be distorted. If private organizations are involved in carrying out government's work, they might have both the incentive and the opportunity to influence what is defined to be public work. This is actually something that in the United States people are very concerned about with private organizations running prisons. If private organizations are in the business of incarcerating people, might they not be motivated to use their political influence to you know, increase prison sentences? It turns out yes, there actually is some evidence that they do that. That's probably a, the most dramatic example of distorted public agenda, but there are many others. Another is, um, you know, citizens don't care if government is doing its work through private organizations. They care, is the work being done well? And if a private agent does the work badly, people don't blame the private sector, they blame the government. And this can be one of the most important risks of involving the private sector in public work, is this reputational entanglement. And finally, something that people uh, do sometimes worry about is, if government ceases to do something itself, it may lose the capacity to do that work in the future. And sometimes this is a big problem, sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's if, you, if government gets out of the business of doing something, it's extremely difficult to get back in the business. Other times, it's uh, quite easy. I actually think this is a, something that people worry about a little bit more than they should. Okay, I promised I would talk about the allocation of discretion. There are many different kinds of private involvement in public work. Okay. And if government itself is in control, if government Ha government keeps to itself discretion in the relationship. Uh, we would call this outsourcing or other kinds of contractual relationships where government says what is to be done, the private sector just does what it's told. So this would be the governmental extreme of discretion. At the other extreme of discretion, where the private sector has all of the control, uh, we think of philanthropy or volunteerism or corp corporate social responsibility. And what I define as collaborative governance is the middle ground. Oop. The middle ground where discretion is importantly shared, okay. where both the public and the private players in the relationship have an important degree of control. Neither is the master, neither is the servant. It's a complex relationship of shared discretion. And of course these Borders are not bright lines that one form shades into the other. But I do think it's important to recognize the different kinds of public-private interaction. And I actually tend not to use myself, I, I tend not to use the term public-private partnership because it sometimes refers to all three. Uh, when I was starting this book, Collaborative Governance, about 10 years ago, I asked my, I, it was going to be called public-private partnerships or something about that, and I asked my research assistant to gather the most popular, the most read books and articles on public-private partnerships. And I you know, closed up my office door with a huge pile of things to read, and the first thing I read about public-private partnerships was about a contract to pick up solid waste. And the second thing I read about public-private partnerships was about a compact to end global poverty. And I thought, if the same term applies to both of those things, it's not a particularly useful term. And so we invented this term collaborative governance, uh, not because it's particularly meaningful, but because it wasn't widely used and we could define it as we wanted. And we define it as an arrangement in which discretion is widely shared. Um, 
I don't insist, by the way, that my colleagues don't use the term public-private partnerships. This is local option. Uh, but for me, it's, uh, it, it is awfully broad. Okay, so some characteristic U.S. examples to give you a sense of what I mean by collaborative governance. Uh, one of my very favorite examples was is Millennium Park in Chicago. If any of you have been uh, to the city of Chicago in the past decade or so, you would have uh, seen this park. And it was a, a, you know, a small example, not very important, but a beautiful illustration of shared discretion, where the government of the city of Chicago built an underground parking garage right in the middle of the city. And somebody said, well, why don't we put a little park on top of it? And somebody else said, wouldn't it be nice if it was a very beautiful park with sculptures and other, other attractions? And the mayor said, but we don't have the money to do that. We just have the money for some grass and maybe a few benches. And the mayor, who was a clever man, and his staff, who were smart people, realized that if they allowed companies and rich families in Chicago some freedom to make their own choices, that they could involve them in building a magnificent park. And so the Pritzker family and other wealthy families and companies um, put up a great deal of money and put in some of the world's best sculpture, including, by the way, a, a Frank Gehry uh, concert hall um, that rhymes a little bit with the building in uh, the Guggenheim in Bilbao. And it is one of those rare things that almost everybody is happy with. Now, the government didn't turn over control, didn't say the private sector can do anything it wants, and they actually turned down some proposals that were considered ugly or considered uh, too much aggrandizing the patrons. The government didn't give away all discretion, but it shared discretion. In exchange for that sharing, it got many advantages from the private sector. Another example is the charter school movement. One of the things that Americans are, get most twisted up in politically is education. I know that here uh, you're much more relaxed about different forms of educational control, but we tend to get into big fights over whether it should be government or the private sector uh, to run schools. And one very happy compromise in recent decades is are something called charter schools, where private organizations run the schools with public resources and answerable to the public sector. So the private organization is not fully in control, the government is not fully in control, discretion is shared. And sometimes this works very well. Often it works very well. Sometimes it works rather badly, on which more later. Um, and another characteristic example is uh, after the terrible events of September 11th, 2001, um, the United States suddenly realized it needed to increase its defenses throughout the, the country. And one particular area of concern were ports, where a maritime port was suddenly re recognized as incredibly vulnerable. All kinds of things that bad guys could do to cause damage in or through a port. And so the Coast Guard, I believe there's a Coast Guard in, in Spain as well, sort of a, a, a naval force responsible for domestic protection. The Coast Guard was given the, the job of figure out ways to secure the ports. And uh, you can imagine, for example, requiring all ships to anchor 10 miles from shore until they were thoroughly shipped, searched. You can imagine ways to secure a port that would be very inefficient. Uh, you could also imagine a long list of government standards for, for safety measures that every facility, every, every factory, every shipper, everybody associated with the, with the port would have to do exactly what the government said. And that could be inefficient as well. And there was actually a, uh, a remarkable uh, commander named uh, Suzanne Engelbert, who was put in charge of this. She actually raised her hand and said, I think I can figure this out. And she held a long series of meetings with hundreds of people from companies and cities and all the stakeholders involved in the ports. And she came up with a plan that would be, nobody has to do anything in particular 
There's no single mandate involved in port security, but everybody has to convince the local Coast Guard official that they have taken steps to lower the risk of terrorism. So very flexible, a lot of shared discretion. You're not allowed to maintain a situation that's dangerous, but you're allowed to find your own way, your own most efficient way of lowering risks. So these are three examples of true collaboration where discretion is shared. And the reason I mention these is that each of these functions you could imagine being done differently. So involving the private sector does not necessarily mean collaborative governance. Uh, if you think about, you know, Millennium Park is a collaborative way of delivering a park, but you can, you can imagine having the private sector involved uh, in terms that the government kept all the discretion and just, you know, let contracts for doing this or that function. And you can imagine uh, parks where the private sector has all the discretion. In fact, uh, near the city where I went to, to high school, Indianapolis, uh, that one of the best parks in town was actually the corporate campus of a company called Eli Lilly, and it had nothing to do with government. It just was a, a beautiful green area that the corporation uh, kept on its own. Likewise with schools, there's the collaborative approach of charter schools, but you can imagine, and in fact you can see, areas where the private sector is involved in schools that have nothing to do with private discretion. They're just doing government's bidding. And you can imagine and even see schools where the private sector is fully in control. And likewise with port security. Just because there's private involvement doesn't mean it's collaborative. So collaborative governance is not new, goes way back, it's not rare. I think it's underanalyzed relative to, to its importance. I think that its distinction from other forms of public-private interaction is too seldom recognized. It has broad potential to do good things, uh, but it can also go wrong. There are multiple ways in which collaborative governance can fail. And it's often mismanaged. Okay. Here is the generic challenge of collaboration. Here is the broad description of what's involved in getting collaboration right. Okay. You design the delivery model and you select and motivate collaborators so you maximize the gains and you minimize the losses of private discretion. And there almost always are losses involved in private discretion. Almost always are things where the private player will do things that wouldn't be government's first choice. So it's not avoiding any losses from private discretion, but making sure that the balance is favorable so that the net benefits of the relationship are better than what you could get from alternative models. And these alternative models include government doing things itself, but it also includes other forms of public-private interaction, such as simple contracting, where government does not share discretion. And I won't go into all this, but uh, these are some of the examples in our book. The point is, sometimes collaboration works out wonderfully. Um, this right here is actually one of the sculptures in L Millennium Park which is one of the very best examples of public-private collaboration. You know, if it's the right model, if it's carefully analyzed, if it's skillfully managed, it can work out extremely well. And conversely, if it's not the right model, if it's not well analyzed, if it's not well managed, it can work out very badly. It's actually uh, the United States until recently and probably again soon, uh, delegated the task of managing lending for college students uh, to private banks on terms of shared discretion. And it worked out extremely badly. Uh, the banks found ways to make uh, profits that were far more than fair and provided bad service to the, uh, to the students. This was an example of collaborative governance, shared discretion that worked out badly. And the whole range can be seen. Sometimes it goes well, sometimes it doesn't go well. And it's not just luck. You know, if it, if it goes well, it's because the model was chosen appropriately, it was analyzed carefully, it was managed with skill. So these managerial imperatives of collaborative governance, and this is something worth stressing, they are fundamentally analytical. We often uh, tend to think of, those of us who, who train people in government, we tend to think of 
policy design, policy choice is very analytical. And management is more straightforward. There's the distinction between policy analysis and public management. If your model is collaboration, those two converge. Okay. The management of collaborations is complex and demanding, and it requires high-level talent for implementation, not just for policy design. And this is something different. So in some ways, it's the convergence of policy analysis and public management. Okay. Now, here's the challenge uh, that, to which uh, collaborative governance can speak. There's an imbalance, I actually alluded to this earlier, there's an imbalance in most of the rich countries, especially in the English-speaking countries, but I think in most of the rich countries, uh, between the public sector and the private sector. Some of this is new, some of this is built in. Uh, most public sector institutions are anch anchored to a particular, particular population, particular locale. You know, governments can't choose their citizen, citizens. They can't choose their, uh, their region. They're, they're rooted. Okay. Uh, they confront constraints on innovation, and this is for a good reason. You know, people count on government for services, for rules, for law, and there are often concerns about government changing too quickly. Uh, sometimes this is, goes overboard. Sometimes government is slow when it doesn't have to be slow. But there are legitimate reasons for government to be careful about innovation. And this is something that is relatively new. Most public organizations face challenges in getting and keeping the very best human resources. So government is chronically short on top talent. Okay. Well, at the same time, most private sector institutions are very flexible on their mission, their constituency, their locale. Remember the uh, Royal Gopothgua uh, Company of Caracas. When it decided that uh, Caracas, Venezuela, wasn't where the action was anymore, it could instantly become the Gipuzkoa Corporation uh, for, the, for the Philippines. No problem, government organizations can't do that. Uh, and likewise, even, even a private organization as unusual and broadly accountable as uh, Mondragon doesn't have to stay in the same industry. You know, if they decide that a founding industry doesn't, doesn't work out quite as well as it used to, uh, th they will move slower than a conventional corporation, but they can still move in ways that a government usually does not. Um, private organizations are empowered to innovate. They have more right to change than public orga organizations do. And they're usually required to innovate. You know, if they, unless they're completely free from, innovate, from, comp from competition, they will be obliged to change. And again, increasingly important, private sector organizations are a favored employer for, uh, for top talent. Uh, Dean Van Slyk and I were actually lamenting yesterday how many of our best students go into the private sector uh, when the public sector needs them, and that's what we're training them for. But the private sector is so much more uh, attractive as an employer that many people who should be in government go in the private sector. So how do we resolve this imbalance between the capability of the public sector and the private sector. Well, one way is to strengthen government or less uh, attractively weaken business to fix the imbalance. I am not holding my breath for this to occur. I think we're going to be dealing with this public-private imbalance for a very long time. Another possibility is to count on socially responsible businesses to fill government's role. This is incredibly popular in a lot, of, uh, a lot of circles. I do a lot of work with Harvard Business School, and I would say this would be the normal attitude among both the professors and the students at Harvard Business School. We don't need government. You know? We can count on socially responsible business, we can count on social enterprise to do all of the things the government used to do. Uh, I think this is a fashionable attitude, I think this is a profoundly misguided attitude, but it is an option. I think the third approach 
is to collaborate, set up arrangements for collaboration between the public and private sectors. So yielding discretion, accepting some of the losses of yielding discretion, but preserving that vital link to democratic accountability, getting the benefits of private involvement, but without surrendering all the benefits of government. So collaborative governance, it's not new, it's not rare, it's also not ideal. It's not my first choice, maybe. My first choice would probably be having very effective, very accountable public organizations and have business do what business is good at. But that's not an option today. So it, this is often our best, our best feasible option for creating public value in what I think will be a long era of public-private imbalance. A special case of the Basque country, and these are very tentative observations. I have spent now about two and a half days in the Basque country. I've read one book. I've looked at Wikipedia. I've had some conversations with Javier Font. So I am the farthest from being a Basque expert. Although I actually realized, uh, I learned that um, uh, Ignatius Loyola was a Basque. And since I had many years of Jesuit education, I guess I was made a little bit Basque without knowing it. Um, but here are some tentative observations. The special features I perceive in the Basque country are almost all advantages, almost all ways that allow Basques to do better than other people in collaborative governance. And these include a small population, everybody seems to know everybody, the importance of reputation makes good behavior accountability much more likely than in complex, uh, heterogeneous, anonymous societies. That's a plus. I think the sense of shared identity and tradition is a huge plus as well. The, the fact that the businesses see themselves not just as capitalists, but also as Basques, very important. I think the, the distinctive culture that is probably, you know, most famously exemplified in Mondragon, but shows up in many corporations, is an advantage. So in general, I think the Basque country has many, many opportunities to get the benefits and avoid the risks of public-private collaboration. Um, and yet, effective collaboration does require public sector strength. I think it's important to remember that collaborative, collaborative governance doesn't mean government is less important, it means government's role is important in different ways. And there are some complexities. The, the Basque governance is very layered. You have the localities, the provinces, the autonomous community, the nation of Spain and EU. And this has, there are lots of advantages to this. This can be a huge plus, but it also means the public sector is complex and complexity can involve risk. So that's one feature to keep in mind. I've heard also that the civil service in the Basque country, while still very strong, is perhaps not as uniformly strong as it once was and not as uniformly strong as it needs to be. If this is true, that's a concern because effective collaboration does require very good civil service to manage it. I think you have the complex parliamentary coalitions that we see here. Uh, again, a, a layer of complexity that can make collaboration a little bit riskier. So there is a potential, even in the Basque country, for underestimating the risks of private discretion. Now, like any academic, I, I did feel obliged to point out the risks and the negative sides. I will say, on balance, I think collaborative governance and the Basque country are a very good match. I suspect that I will be, when I talk to other groups, saying you should only wish you were as lucky as the Basques. You should only wish, wish that your culture was so well set up for public-private collaboration. And yet, collaboration is a tricky business. You know, it's easy to make mistakes. So you know, just because you are on the right path doesn't mean that there's no tree branch hanging over it. So be careful. Thank you. Zer dute aman komunean irudi hauek? Alako ezer ez zegoen duela aman urte. Nola izango da gure bizitza emendik amar urtera? 
etorkizuna eraikiz, Gipuzkoako foru aldundiaren egitasmoa da. Gu guztion etorkizuna eraikitzeko egitasmoa. Guztiok batera. Pertsonak eta erakundeak elkarlanean jarriz, Gipuzkoaren erronka nagusiak definitzeko. Enpresak laborategi bihurtuz, ekonomia gizarte eta kulturarloko politika berriak probatzeko. Universitateen laguntzarekin eta herrialdea urregatuen engandik ikasiz. Irten bide errealak erabiliz, gure etorkizuna eraikitzeko modu berri bat. Gipuzkoar bakoitza bere etorkizunaren jabe egiteko eredu berri bat. Dagoeneko ari gara erronka nagusiei aurre egiten eta horretan jarraituko dugu. Guztion artean erabakitako etorkizunak bihur dezala Gipuzkoa, bizitzeko, lan egiteko eta pertsona bezala garatzeko lekuriko nena Europan. Eskerrik asko, Iron Donak Gijona. Iruitzen balin bat zaizue, sarrerako ekitaldiaren ondoren, ordu erdi bat hartuko dugu kafe bat hartzeko, gombiatuta zaudete denok, men aldameneko gelan hartuko dugu kafe bat, eta ordu erdi barru beste itzaldi batekin, lankidetzazko gobernuaren inguruko beste itzaldi batekin ekingo diogu kasu hontan, Manuel Arenilla Jaunaren eskutik. Beraz, hozen kafe txo bat hartzea eta gero itzen dugu. ¿Qué tienen en común estas imágenes? Nada de esto existía hace 10 años. Pero pensemos ahora en los próximos 10 años. ¿Qué será lo siguiente? Etorkizuna Eraikiz es la respuesta de la Diputación Foral de Guipúzcoa para construir nuestro futuro, todos y todas juntos. Reuniendo a personas en colaboración con el mundo institucional para que definan los proyectos clave para Guipúzcoa. Transformando a las empresas en laboratorios donde ensayar esas nuevas políticas económicas, sociales y culturales, con la ayuda de las universidades y aprendiendo de los países más avanzados. Una nueva forma de construir nuestro futuro mediante soluciones reales. Una nueva forma de hacer a cada una de las personas de Guipúzcoa dueña de su mañana. Ya estamos dando respuesta a nuestros principales retos y seguiremos haciéndolo. Hagamos que el futuro que decidamos entre todos convierta a Guipúzcoa en el mejor lugar de Europa para vivir, trabajar y desarrollarnos como personas.